Technical Business Center, Resin Business School, Mumbai. I welcome you all on this program. It is my honor and it is my privilege to welcome Professor Yunus on this forum, which is jointly organized by International Humanist Management Association and Social Business Center, Resin Business School, and Yunus Center, Bangladesh. With me, uh, Professor Michael Pearson, who is Director of Humanistic Management and Associate Professor for the University of New York, and Dr. Satish Moth, who is Director of Wesley Business School, is joining. And he will take forward some questions and answers. Dear Professor Yunus, Hello. Thank, you very much. thank you very much for giving us time and joining us for addressing this crucial time and to guide us for addressing yeah, this uh, problem which is created because of COVID-19 and how this social business can help us, can help entire for addressing this problem. I know and all of you know that Professor Yunus does not need any introduction. He is pioneer of microcredit and known as a world's banker to the poor. His life work has been to prove that the poor are credit worthy. Professor Yunus is a father of microcredit and social business and founder of Grameen Bank. And everyone knows that he was awarded Nobel Peace Prize in 2006 for his groundbreaking work on microcredit for demonstrating empowering poorest of the poor. Professor Yunus has been awarded 62 honorary doctoral degrees from university across 20 countries and 113 international awards from 26 different countries. Sir, please correct me if numbers are more. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> the famous books are Banker of the Poor, Creating World Without Poverty, and Word of Three Zero. And I read all three books. He devoted his life in empowering people and especially women and marginalized. I would like to quote one of your statement uh, which inspires many millions in this world. That is, one idea, one learn, and one act of kindness can actually transform life of human being and transform community and transform society and nation. Apart from Grameen Bank and microcredit, Professor is also supporting and guiding more than 50 companies. So again, add if more. Some of them are offshoot of Grameen Bank, which fund the local social business that provide employment, education, healthcare, water, clean energy, and many more to over 9 million people in East Africa, Latin America, and India. The philosophy of uh, Professor Yunus' work is to donation into investment in social business. Mm -hmm. And Yunus Social Business tackle poverty from bottom up with the philanthropic venture fund and the top down with the corporate innovation. He has inspired 20 plus global corporations, including Danon, McCain, Base, Uniqlo, MAN, Tata Trust, and many more to build corporate as a social business. On this forum, Professor Simons will talk about social entrepreneurship, social business in post-COVID-19 world. As we all know, COVID-19 has created a devastating impact on economies of nation as all around the world and pulled the world in economic slowdown. So as you always say, be innovative in your thinking. And sometimes you say, be wild in innovation and thinking and find good solutions. So now we all are looking at your uh, innovative thinking and at you to get some creative solution for addressing these challenges. As uh, we already discussed that uh, Professor Yunus will speak around 20 to 25 minutes. And after that, introduction will be taken forward with the questions and answer session with uh, after that. Now, with immense sense of gratitude and honor, now I request Professor Yunus to address the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nisha. Uh, good to see you and good to hear about your work. And I'm delighted to be with you and everybody uh, who are joining in this discussion. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Nisha. Uh, what I would like to draw attention to is the corona crisis. It's a 
crisis which created the massive impact in the whole world. And it is a sudden explosion of attack by the virus. It's hardly 100 days and the whole world is in the grip of uh, this virus. You mentioned that uh, it slowed down the economy. I keep saying that it has put the economy in a coma. It's a non-functioning economy. It's, a, it's, a, it's a put in a dead bed. It's a hardly breathing. And uh, one way I look at it and ask a question, should we try to wake it up? or let it stay in sleep because this economic machine that's a giant machine a global machine has not been a, a good machine for us it was a very harmful machine and right before uh, corona attacked us uh, we are counting days when the world will be over uh, the global warming is taking over the whole world and we are talking about how many days or months and years left for the human being to survive on this planet when the temperature of the world goes over two degrees Celsius and that's not too far. And uh, children, uh, teenagers were marching on the streets all over the world, uh, Fridays for Future saying that uh, you have destroyed our life, you older generation uh, has destroyed our life because we have no place to go, this world will be over before we are grown up. You have been totally irresponsible in making that happen to us. And if these teenagers are demonstrating on the street, imagine all the unborn grandchildren, uh, what they will complain they will have no life on this planet. So that was the situation prior to coronavirus. And when we talk about waking up the machine uh, to go back there, uh, uh, that would be quite insane. Why should we go back there? So waking up the machine will mean uh, this will take us back to where we stopped. And going back to that level, would be suicidal. Uh, it's a committing suicide, knowing fully well that we are going to finish uh, in a uh, few years. And on top of this global warming, I point out that uh, this is not alone as a cr uh, problem created for us before the corona crisis. Wealth concentration. All the wealth of the world is concentrated in a handful of people. And it's getting worse and worse every day. And luckily, when the machine is now put to sleep, uh, that uh, process has stopped. There is no wealth concentration of that kind anymore. Uh, and then uh, we're saying that this is an explosive situation. If you continue like this concentration of wealth in few hands, uh, it will create a ticking time bomb, uh, which will explode politically and socially and make impossible for human being to interact and survive on this planet. And luckily, that process has been stopped. And then there's another process which was in progress, removal of people from the workplace and make them unemployed because of the introduction of uh, um, artificial intelligence. Machines will be working, human beings will be pushed out of work. And it will happen very quickly. A massive number of people, billions of people will be out of work. And we don't know what will happen to the world in a situation like that. And all these things were coming. It's not uh, unknown. It's not, it's not controversial. You may put the date here and there, but everybody has, knows that this is the direction we're moving, the global warming, wealth concentration, massive unemployment. Uh, so Corona has done us a great favor, putting this machine to stop. Now, should we go back, wake it up? My answer is no going back. We don't want to go back. We don't to wake up this machine. We want to create a new machine. We can do that and go in a different direction so that we create a world where there'll be no global warming. 
there'll be no wealth concentration. There'll be no massive unemployment. We can design it and make it happen. So this is the good time to do that. And there, we have to make sure what kind of um, uh, engine we build for that purpose. One of the things that we have to make sure we build in a proper way is the financial system. Because the finance current, the one that was uh, uh, running the whole machine of the system uh, is a machine, the, uh, the financial system is a vehicle who mobilized all the wealth from the bottom and pushed it in the top, creating wealth concentration. And so this is a financial system which works in a wrong direction. It takes wealth from everybody and puts it in the hands of a few people. So we don't want to take this machine with us. We have to design financial system in a different way, which will be working in the reverse way. Take the wealth that is concentrated in few hands and gradually bring it down and distribute it uh, among all the people in a, in a financial system, not by question, not by government order, not by uh, uh, grabbing things from others. It's a natural process of uh, working of the economic machinery, which will gradually uh, create a system where wealth is shared by everybody else. And we'll make sure that we do not bring the artificial intelligence into that system where we will have a new world for ourselves. And the financial system uh, has to rebuild in a way that it transforms the economy and transform the people. Today's economic system, uh, the financial system denies the services for the vast majority of people, saying that they are not credit worthy. That's where we created the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh to challenge that. We said the right question is whether people are credit worthy or not. The right question is whether the banking system is people worthy or not. You have created the banking system, which is totally unworthy of people. It doesn't help the people. It deprives the people. So we have to create a new system. So that's where uh, one issue becomes important when we talk about that financial system. We talk about microcredit coming bank non collateralized banking instead of banking system defend, uh, dependent on uh, collateral only exclusively. So we have to undo that. And a social business banking system. Grameen Bank is a social business banking bank, meaning that when we talk about social business, as you are familiar, is a business to solve people's problems rather than make money. So we have no intention of making money by running businesses like banking systems. So we create microcredit bank as a social business bank. So there's no intention of owners making personal profit. So the idea of concept of a social business has to be integrated in the financial system, also in the business system. That is the core of the redesigning of the entire system. And by doing that, we bring uh, investment for creating social business to solve problems that we see around us, problem of water, problem of healthcare, problem of um, uh, activities for the unemployed young people and so on. So this is the kind of uh, financial system we want to build. Corona has revealed some things as we went along and we have seen it in the newspaper and the television also. It was very much in the focus of the migrant workers in India, how massively they were moving from one state to another state, going back home because they have no work, no place to go, live, no income. So why stay here? We better go home, stay with our family, we stay with our children. And moving from one state to another state, they, the harassment they have gone through and the indignities they have suffered and the physical problems they have suffered. Everybody saw it and felt extremely sympathetic. Now the question is why people leave their homes to go and work with other, other places? The simple reason, there's no future in the places they live. So they are in search of future, in search of finding a survival strategy for their family, 
someone going and working someplace and sending some money home. Uh, so that re kind of uh, re uh, brings it out how our economic policy has been uh, uh, twisted to focus on the urban areas rather than on the rural areas. And the corona system, corona crisis has pushed, uh, clear, made it clear, very clear that we should, be, we should be looking at where the people live. People live in the rural areas. Vast majority of the population of any of these SAR countries live in the rural areas. But our concentration of all our economic activity in the urban area. So rural people have to live in search of their food, in search of their work to the urban areas. That's not the right kind of uh, economic system we have. And this uh, new uh, thinking, new world, would be designing a, a, a system which will be creating opportunities for people in the places where they are born, rather than to have to go to some place and suffer through all the harassment of living in the slums and uncertainties, unhealthy conditions, and so on and so forth. And this is because of the way we build the system, the, uh, that all the opportunities are in urban areas. So the institutions will be built exclusively for the rural areas. And I've been arguing that the banks uh, can also be exclusively designed to work in the rural areas. Social business banks like Grameen Bank, microcredit banks should be working in the rural areas, exclusively designed for rural areas. Some may sound it, uh, some may find it um, uh, kind of uh, uh, strange to do, create institutions just for the rural areas. We have done it 42 years back, Grameen Bank. We called it Grameen Bank and really meant it Grameen Bank. And two, 42 years later, we have more, nearly 3,000 branches all over the country. Not a single branch of Grameen Bank is created in any urban area of any of the town or the city in Bangladesh. We don't work there. If it is a, if it is a municipality, if it is a corporation, if it's a city area, we don't work within that area. So it is exclusively rural areas serving the rural people. Once you create exclusive rural institutions, then you understand the problems of the rural people. Today is the urban institution which extends itself to the rural areas, give their version of the economy and try to pull the people out of the rural areas to come and work for the cities. That's not the right thing. The right thing for the institution to solve the problem where it exists. That's where the social business comes in. Social business is designed to solve problem wherever it exists. So we create all these opportunities in the rural areas by creating exclusive rural institutions like banking, insurance companies, uh, transportation companies, everything. It's a, where the entire focus is in the rural areas. This is designed for rural areas. So the question of it's ever trying to pull people out of the rural areas doesn't ex uh, exist because it is work is in the rural area. And uh, so the, our objective would be in the new economy that we want to build, migrant workers, the millions of them who had to come back home, will not go back leaving their homes in future. They will stay there where they, and they will have to create opportunities for them. There are plenty of opportunities in the rural areas. But we got so mesmerized by the factories, by the attraction of the city life, that we thought that's the only place to live. So we made sure that everybody has to come there. So our young people, when they uh, pass the teenage, they are rushing to the cities for in search of their opportunities because there is no job in the rural areas. But the rural areas have plenty of jobs, plenty of opportunities. So this is one area that we have to redesign the financial system, make sure everybody can create their own fortune, living where they are born, and transform the economy of the rural people and the places where they live. And the coronavirus has also, corona crisis has also revealed something else, the informal sector. And the, there's a lot of questions about the informal sector, life versus livelihood, whether they can uh, go back to their work to, to make a living or uh, endanger their life by being uh, active uh, outside and trying to make a living because otherwise they do not have an income. The question is, 
why do we call them informal sector and make it as it sound like it's something derogatory that they're doing something they shouldn't have done the funny thing is informal sector accommodates more than half the working population of India and many other countries like Bangladesh and other countries, more than half the working population are in informal sector. Why do we feel this is a uh, kind of uh, uh, sector where as soon as possible we should pull these people out and push them into the formal sector? What do the formal sector offer for them? Jobs, very, very low paid jobs, insecure jobs, without any contract on those kind of jobs, working working, in, as a domestics, working as the cleaners, working in the streets. That's the kind of job people get when you move from informal sector. But what is informal sector something to be uh, disrespectful? Is it something bad? And I always say, no, this is the most uh, potential sector of the economy and potential sector of the people. This is the people sector. This is where people create their own life. They are not us expecting any support from anybody else. They take care of themselves and they are not making any noise for anybody else. They find opportunities, tiny opportunities to make a living for themselves. That's what the uh, informal sector is all about. And I said this is the wrong, this is the wrong terminology used by conventional e economists. Uh, to kind of uh, uh, express the fact that they are not doing the right thing. I said they are doing the right thing. Uh, we should call it uh, um, uh, emerging entrepreneurial sector. These are all entrepreneurs. They are, they are on their own. They are not uh, bothering anybody. They are uh, selling things on the street. They're making things at home and selling uh, to other people. Uh, they are on their own and nobody helps them. Uh, but they have, they flourish uh, without anybody's support. And why isn't there support? And that's the question I'm asking. If I'm calling it emerging entrepreneurial uh, sector, this is, what, this is the seedbed of the entrepreneurship. So we should be applauding it. We should be feeling extremely happy to support them rather than... Uh, uh, kind of saying that they are doing the wrong thing. They should as soon as possible pass on to the formal sector and become street cleaners. I said, no, they are the most distinguished people creating their own enterprise and using their own talent, own creative power to make a living for themselves. Why don't we go and support them? And I compare, compare this uh, uh, emerging uh, entrepreneurial class uh, or the informal sector and compared to the labor force. You see, for labor, there are so many things we have done. I'm not saying this is wrongly done, it's very well done. And I appreciate and applaud that. Uh, we have uh, given them legal rights, enormous legal uh, facilities created over time to protect the interest of the labor. We have allowed them, encouraged them, and give them a central stage in terms of labor unions so that they can have collective bargaining and all that. And as a matter of fact, we have given so much importance to the labor. We have created a ministry of labor at the federal level, at the state level, ministry of labor. Uh, they are the people who are paid by somebody. Uh, they are hired by somebody and we want to make sure they are getting paid well. They are, not, uh, they are not underpaid. They are not uh, terminated anytime they wish. All kinds of things we come as protection. We, as soon as we look at the entrepreneurial sector, uh, the seedbed of entrepreneurship, we don't see anything, government supporting them in any way. I said, why don't we create in the new world, we can create chamber of commerce for uh, entrepreneurial, emerging entrepreneurial class so that they have their own place like any other chamber of commerce that we have and give government the presentation, government uh, connection and protect them. There are lots of things they are harassed by the law, by the law enforcing agencies, by the businesses and everybody, uh, because they are kind of treated as a refrain in the society. I said, why should it be so? They should have their own chambers of commerce. They should have their own uh, uh, legal rights to organize themselves. And they will have their own ministry too, Ministry of Emerging uh, Entrepreneurial uh, Sector. 
And if they do not uh, immediately create a ministry, new ministry for them, at least they should be accommodated in the labor ministry. It's the Ministry of Labor and the Ministry of Entrepreneurial uh, sector, emerging entrepreneurial sector, so that we have some place where we have uh, something that we can support them. Most important support they need is the finance. That's what is lacking completely. So we create enormous arrangement so that they can have access, easy access to financial resources so that they can move on and grow, continue to grow as far as they want to go. So we create uh, financial systems like a microcredit system, as a social business, nobody wants to grab profit out of them. We create social business um, equity uh, investment as the venture capital uh, funds. We can so that anybody who wants to grow in, uh, in in the seedbed of entrepreneurship, they can grow as big as they want because no bank will ever finance them. They fall victim to the loan sharks and everybody else, and uh, under all those conditionalities, they have to work. Why don't we give them space so that they are protected, they can grow soon. And we just give the recognition. Yes, you are doing the wonderful thing. We are behind you. That's very important to, to do because this is about half the population. So we see the, uh, the difficulty of this section where uh, we understand uh, the labor, the labor when the coronavirus came, uh, we made sure their uh, salaries continue, nobody terminates it and taking advantage of it. Many other facilities we have given, which, which is good, which is important, but we are not worrying about the uh, new entrepreneurial class, emerging entrepreneurial class. How do we do that? So we have to pay attention to that. And we create a venture capital fund, not only for new entrepreneurial class, also for the young people, unemployed young people who are rushing to go to the cities. And instead of let them go to the cities and then in the Corona crisis, um, became victims of all kinds of uh, uh, harassment. So we made sure that they become, instead of job seekers, they become entrepreneurs. Uh, they can become entrepreneurs provided we can provide the financing for them. That's where the social business venture capital is very important. And we have done that in Bangladesh uh, as a side program financial institution. Uh, anybody uh, who wants, uh, who has an idea to start a business, we come and invest and we become partner. It's a venture capital, so it's not a loan, it's equity participation. So you come up with the, your idea, we come up with your money, our money, we get a partnership with you. So you work uh, for the business and make it successful, and over time, you return the money that we gave you. Because we are social business, we are not interested in making profit out of you. You keep the profit, we just help you to overcome the problem and you return the money that we gave you. And that's done and then so all the business is yours. If you need a second round of money, we'll give you another chunk of money so that you can move on. This can be done for the entire informal, quote unquote, informal sector, that this fund can be. So they can stay home and build up the rural economy. Rural economy has so many opportunities. So, and, and that rural economy that I'm talking about is, should not be an appendix to the urban economy. Today, rural economy is a kind of a uh, footnote in the economy of the urban areas. The real economy is in the urban areas and the rural economy, although it's a much bigger than the, in terms of population, much bigger than the urban uh, economy, but it's a footnote. We want to separate it out. There will be two economies. One is the urban economy and the rural economy. Rural economy will grow, rural economy will have part uh, uh, deal with the urban economy uh, in, 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 in an, as an independent uh, economy rather than uh, take uh, whatever uh, they can give to you to the rural economy. Rural economy today is looked at as a kind of a factory for producing labor. So rural economy produces the labor and sends it to uh, send them to urban economy to keep the machine running there. Uh, and that's the only role rural economy has. And also rural economy produce the primary products so that the urban economy can process it, make money for themselves. So we don't want to do that. We want to make sure our rural economy are not the supplier of labor. Rural economy is the thriving bed for entrepreneurial entities and entrepreneurial activities uh, uh, bursting out in many different directions. Today, 
distance and location is unimportant. That's what the coronavirus demonstrated that again, wherever you are, you can deal with the whole world uh, because technology makes it happen. So your presence in the urban areas uh, is not important. Your idea, wherever you live is important. So if I can live in the village, I can live in with my family, with my children, uh, and live in my place where I was born, and I do everything with the rest of the world. So the first thing are rural institutions will be exclusive institution. Rural economy will be an economy by itself and deal with the urban economy as a kind of parallel economy, not as an appendix, not as a footnote to the rural economy and uh, urban economy and so on. So these are the ideas that the, now the coronavirus has give us. When we build the new world, we build it a new way of thinking. If you keep on the old way of thinking, we are stuck with an old engine. An old engine will take you back to where we were. And that was not a very happy situation. We don't want to go back. We want to create a totally new world, which which given the opportunity, we grab the opportunity and make it happen. That's the task that we are given by Corona crisis. And the Corona crisis is not is a crisis, but it's a great opportunity. We should not miss this opportunity. No way we can do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Yunus. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, thanks a lot for uh, giving such a wonderful ideas, which is focusing on uh, rural economy, developing yeah. a rural economy, focusing on rural economy. And uh, the, the most important thing which you quoted here now, that we don't make it a footnote of rural economy, make it a mainstream of, as rural economy. Absolutely. And, and labor should not be as a supplier of, uh, for uh, urban economy, it should, it should be. It should be. There should be uh, institution focused on rural economy. Uh, so I think uh, all of us have taken uh, very, very intensive input, which is very important for uh, growth of economy, which is very important for entrepreneurial development. And of course, I think all of us will certainly look at the social business, not only the urban perspective, but also in the rural perspective. Uh, now the session is open for question and answer. I would like to request Professor uh, Satish Moth, Director, Resume Business School, to take one or two questions and uh, ask questions. Uh, Professor Moth. Yeah. Hello. Uh, good Hello. afternoon from Indian Time. Hi. Good afternoon, Satish. Yeah. Yeah. It was a very enlightening uh, address. While listening, uh, though I had two prepared questions, but after listening to you, those questions were already answered. So now I have a different set of questions. Go right ahead. Go right ahead. <laughs> the first thing is, uh, listening to you, I start believing that the, the era of globalization is over. And uh, as our prime minister said, it is uh, vocal for local. So whether it is an international movement or a movement within the country, are you suggesting that this corona is going to reset, restart and reboot the economy where globalization will be a thing of the past? This is point number one. And point number two is uh, when uh, people go back to their rural areas, the problem why they come to cities and have their micro businesses is because uh, they can earn some living there because there is huge demand because of the population. When they go back to their uh, rural areas and they want to set up their micro businesses, there is not so much demand. There are no many, so many consumers. So how will they sustain their uh, rural businesses? If you could answer these two questions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let me try with the first one, the globalization. Uh, you, you mentioned that globalization is over. I can take uh, the reverse position. I said, uh, I could say the globalization is strengthened because of the corona crisis. Uh, corona crisis, uh, the uh, duration of the whole crisis is uh, probably around 100 days. It started in Wuhan. In 100 days, it captured the whole world. It made the whole world get locked up in their rooms. Not just one tiny place here and the tiny place. This entire world, within 100 days, it made it happen. So it showed how quickly the whole world can be brought into uh, a situation 
where everybody has to hide behind the doors. Uh, this is a common enemy, the virus, and the whole world should have responded unifiedly. And this is the time. This is not about local versus federal versus uh, state versus something, nothing. It's a global response to a common enemy. The virus is not different in India, not different in uh, uh, Gujarat or Bang uh, West Bengal or something. It's the same thing, same virus attacking everybody else. So we have a unified thing. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. When virus attacked us, we went back to our own community. We went back to our country. We tried to, each country tried to protect their own people, even fighting with the neighboring country to grab more benefits, uh, facilities for their own country. If you don't have anything, you have to grab something. USA is a good example. They want to grab everything for themselves. You have it or not. I must have it. Those, that attitude is the wrong attitude. So instead of having that unified fight, which we know this is a common thing, we had to do that. And then we had a common institutions who could be leading this fight is the WHO, World Health Organization. And under that leadership, we should be fighting this and we'll be behind this uh, organization, whether it's a weak organization or a strong organization, that will be a matter of discussion later on. But at the moment we have, this is the only command structure we have, we fight with them, with their uh, leadership. That didn't happen. And we went, particularly some powerful nation, uh, went ahead and stopped the money uh, flowing to World Health Organization and wanted to start the uh, investigation against it, weakening the organization. That was the tribal attitude. So we should be overcoming the tribal attitude because the whole world is one place. We, the virus doesn't impact in one way, in another place, one place, another way, in another place. It's the same virus. So I said that it showed how globalization is so important. What you mean, perhaps, that oh, uh, despite the global uh, shape of the nature of the thing, we still have uh, a responsibility to build up our own thing within the frame of the world itself. Uh, we opposed globalization in another context. We opposed globalization because globalization in a capitalist system means the big capital pushing into your uh, place and sucking the uh, juice out of your economy, take it back to their own country. And that is the process of wealth concentration. And wealth concentration could take place because of the globalization of capitalism. It came and uh, occupied the economy and took the juice of the economy to someplace else. That is not the right thing because this is a way of um, greed. Super greed is always uh, running the minor greeds and taking their advantage of their power and taking away the resources from one country to another country. Uh, so, and today wealth concentration is happening, has happened in so, such a way that only half a dozen countries in the whole world uh, has more than 99% of the wealth of the entire world. If you just look at the number of people, you 1% of the population uh, having 99% of the world uh, wealth, and those 1% live in these half a dozen countries. So this is the direction. So it happened because we allowed this capital to flow and the greed to uh, sup make supreme and go on. So where we want to see the globalization is important when we come to the common interest, build the common interest for everybody. Again, Corona becomes a good example. Corona uh, vaccine, for example. A Corona vaccine, you don't want to build a Corona vaccine for your uh, district. Oh, this is my Corona vaccine and I don't want to give it to anybody else. Or this is Indian corona vaccine, I don't want to give it to it. Like the United States saying, this is a US corona vaccine, I don't want to give it to it. Even the corona vaccine is about to be produced and dis 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 uh, distributed from a uh, uh, French company, uh, Sanofi. Sanofi made the announcement recently that first production of Sanofi will go to USA because USA paid already a large amount, sum of money. So, Companies are trying to make it a, as a kind of a product for uh, uh, highest bidder. So that's a kind of uh, uh, narrow way of looking at it. It's not the worldview, it's a narrow view. So we want to bring the worldview. And we are saying, no, that's not how it should be. It should be uh, the corona vaccine should not be considered as something to be owned by anybody. It cannot be owned. It should be a global uh, public good. 
It's like air, global air. Air doesn't belong to anybody. So vaccine shouldn't belong to anybody. It should be for everybody. Uh, it should be a open source product. Nobody has a patent on this. This is the, again a global issue. So we have to have a global thing that to make it happen. And we are suggesting that we should create social business pharmaceutical company, global social business pharmaceutical company to produce the corona vaccines and make sure everybody gets it. Since it's a social business, nobody is interested in making personal money out of it. The whole intention of this company is to make sure it's produced everywhere, all over the world, and it's distributed to everybody so that everybody gets this vaccine as fast as it is produced to the system. So this is the global view. The narrow view is I make money for myself. It's my company. I want to make money. Only five companies in the world who has a large chunk of this medicine uh, patents belonging to them. So they make the super, super profit out of them. We said, no, medicine is life. Medicine's about uh, being uh, protected from the diseases and so on. This should not be a product of profit making. It should be done as a social business. So we, cre we can create social, we don't have to go to the court or go to the parliament to pass legislation for that. All we have to do is to create those social business, create social business pharmaceutical company to produce those medicines and reduce, produce those vaccines and so on. So I would say the time for uh, globalization is automatically here is the technology has made it happen. Like uh, we are discussing here, globally probably is heard, and I'm, I'm not sure who are the participants. It could be anywhere. Anywhere in the world can participate in this discussion. And that's the globalization part of it. So we can, cannot reverse this part. We take advantage of this part and take away uh, whatever uh, minor glitch it may have. But the future is about uh, building a common interest economy for everybody. It's a, it's a global attitude. Uh, when we create problem uh, of global warming, it's not global warming for India or global warming for Bangladesh. It's global warming for the entire world. Uh, and again, uh, for uh, wealth concentration, it's not for one country or another country, it's for the whole world. So we have to fight in a common way, common interest, common way of doing that. When, when uh, uh, artificial intelligence starts showing people away from their jobs, it will not be concentrated, it will not be limited to one country. It will be global. Everybody will be losing their job because same way, maybe timing-wise, it will be uh, faster and slower in one country or another, but it will be a global shift of people from, from the job and machine taking it over. So I would say uh, globalization is the future. We cannot undo that. The second question about microcredit and uh, the rural market. The demand. Oh yes, oh, yes, 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 yes. That's the second question you had. Uh, right, you have the question. Uh, today, you uh, produce in the rural areas uh, and bring it to the urban areas. The women who are uh, sitting in home making handicrafts. This has some the intermediary person has to collect this, bring it to urban areas to sell it because they have the money, because they have the income. They can spare this. They have the purchasing power. That's why everybody wants to sell it in the urban areas. I'm not against selling it in the urban areas. Uh, I'm talking about, I have the fair share of this thing, business. I control the business. They don't control the business. That's what I'm saying. I said, rural economy should be a parallel economy. We should not be appendix. It's not the guy from the agents, agent from the city coming and doing it, and we get a little money out of it. Which you sell, like uh, all the agricultural produce, you see it every day. Uh, you have uh, uh, tons and tons of tomato lying around. You sell at the penny worth uh, of ten, uh, kilogram or per ton of uh, tomatoes. When you start buying in the, the supermarket in the city, uh, is a uh, high price. So who gets the money? It's somebody else in the city. I said, no, we control this price. We make sure what you pay for our tomato. We make sure if you're not buying it, we don't throw it in the street or in the highways because nobody picked it up in the truck. We said, no, we don't worry. We will process it. We'll make tomato paste. We'll do tomato juice. We'll do it here. That's the parallel economy. We don't wait for you. We produce things on our own. We process everything. You wait for us in line. What, if we don't give you food, you are hungry. You cannot survive because we control your uh, basic elements. All the, all the food that you consume, we will not be the seller of the primary products. 
we will be giving an absolutely finished product at our terms. And you buy it, and since you have the money, you pay us. We are not here at your mercy that you come and do whatever you want. So that's the kind of thing we're saying. Once you create that economy, the opportunities for everybody is there. Uh, so whether we like it or not, whether we notice or not, the informal sector exists in the rural areas too. How do they survive? They sell things, do things, uh, transport people. They have plenty of opportunities. But once you provide them the financing of it, you see they'll be designing it completely new way. They will create their own economy. Instead of you are re reaching out to the already created economy, which is the urban area, we create the economy, new economy in the rural area. That's where life is. We build our own economy. It's like an argument be between a rich country and a poor country. Uh, the poor country, okay, you have to supply the raw materials to the rich country and they will do the job and they will come. The rich poor countries don't have facilities and so on. When the rural poor country said, no, I will be the uh, country like you, uh, uh, deal with you at equal terms, then th start, things start happening. Unless we make the decision that we were to transform uh, the economy by ourselves. In the beginning, it will be a small part, but gradually you'll see people uh, in, in, in an age of uh, this uh, globalization, uh, the uh, running business from a remote village with the city is not a problem. I know how to, how many tons of, how many trucks, loads of potato you want, you deal with me on the phone. I can control it. Not the guy sitting there with the phone in the city directing his agents to come and pick it up from there. His agents don't come. We sell it to you, we deal directly with you. Those are the kind of terms that we have to use, that we have to build our own protect. We already have the resources. Simply these resources we don't control. Somebody else controls it. So we are at the mercy of them. We don't want to be at the mercy of them. We new, bring new production, new areas and so on. We build our own processing factories. We produce our own warehouses. You don't buy it, we'll keep it in our warehouses. We'll not throw it on the highways anymore that we used to do it in the past. That's the idea that we have. There's a plenty of room for people to do things. It's simply, we are not supporting them. That's my complaint. I'm saying we are talking about the informal sector. Not a single thing any government has ever done for the informal sector, saying that, oh, this is informal. This is not something that we touch. Why not? That's where the half the population, half the working population of the country lives. And this is their future. Why don't we give them the facilities, the financing facilities, ideas, and uh, uh, their uh, chambers of commerce to negotiate with the deal with the others, just like any other businesses. Uh, and I was giving an example of the labor. If labor has so many laws, so many institutions, so many unions, so many facilities, I'm not grudging them, but I'm saying simply informal sector who is not paid by anybody, not a penny. We don't want to give them a single benefit of that. I said, why don't we have a ministry of uh, uh, emerging uh, entrepreneurial sector? so that we really dedicate to them and make sure they are not suffered, they are not harassed, they are not uh, being kicked out from places where they say it is illegal to do that. So they will have a, their own medallion to say that I'm here, I'm with the full right to sell things, do things as I am because I belong to this class, I belong to this chamber, you deal with my chamber, those kind of things. So you have to give them the rights and the ability thank, thank, and the financial you, support. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Mohd, for asking wonderful question because if you have a good question, then suddenly we'll have a good answer. So thank, thanks a lot. Thank uh, I, I invite uh, Dr. Michael Pearson I, uh, for uh, taking questions from our audience. Uh, Dr. Michael, Dr. Michael is a director of International Humanistic Management Association and he is associate professor in Northern University. Uh, may I invite Dr. Michael Pearson to take few questions from audience. Thank you, Nisha, and thank you, Professor Yunus, uh, for, for being Hi, on. Hi, Michael. Um, so I'm trying, there are so many questions, so I'm trying uh, <laughs> to connect them all in some way. I think what I'm sensing, there are a number of questions in terms of the power structure and how to shift the power structure given your suggestions. It sounds to me that dignity and dignifying those people that are currently unseen, the informal sector, the, the poorer uh, people in the, in the rural areas, et cetera, that's sort of a core element in terms of getting and creating that foundation for this shift. 
what are three things that you say we can do and this community here is mostly academic what do you think can this community contribute uh in that transition well one i would say uh, which is the common allegation that i make I blame myself as being a part of the academic world because all the misery that we created around the world, uh, we have a big role in it. We created all these ideas, all these concepts, all these structures. Uh, they are all coming from us, the academic folks or, or people around the academic folks. And then we not only create them, we pass it on to our next generation uh, and contaminate their mind into thinking in a wrong way. So wrong thinking has created the wrong world. Uh, we, created a, we have created a very selfish world because uh, we made the core of our economics is the selfishness. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a system where a human being is supposed to be uh, driven by self-interest, self -in, selfish interest. So that's how we created the whole world. I said, if you had looked at human being as someone who is a, combination of self-interest at the same time common interest. So we have discovered right from the beginning there are two kinds of business. One, to follow the self-interest by creating profit maximizing business and another is a system of business for the common interest which are not driven by profit maximization is driven by zero personal interest. We don't want to make any money because we are interested in the others. Uh, solving people's problem. And that's where the social business idea comes in. So we would have created the social business on the first day and world will not be like this. We, because of our selfishness, we are so busy making money. We didn't care whether we are destroying the world by pollution, by world global warming, by wealth concentration, by um, massive unemployment. We didn't care. We still don't care. So that's why I said when the engine is uh, in comma now, which machine is come in comma, let's build a new engine, which will have two parts, uh, the, se the self-interest part and the common interest part. And it's up to you to decide how much of common interest you want to pursue, how much of self-interest you want to pursue. So it's an option. It's not a, a dictate from any dictator. It's a, you decide what you want. But today we, we don't do that. So we have wrong ideas put in the minds of young people continue to do things. We go to our business school, we teach our young people how to go to the businesses, work for them, and make tons and tons of money for them so that the shareholders can benefit from the, your work that you have done. In the process, what you do to the world, what you do to the uh, future of your children, you don't care, you sacrifice everything because that's not what you teach in the classroom. You worry about your children, you worry about your grandchildren, you worry about the planet, you don't do that then you don't have a business, they say. And business is business, meaning you have to be really blind to other issues. Only thing you sniff is money. So those are the kind of things which created the uh, massive problem for the world. So we have to take the responsibility. Now this is a good time to redesign the system in the right way and compensate for all the wrong things that we have done so that the world will forgive us. There are a couple Hello. of other questions in terms of the, yeah. the breaking the power. So one is the academics that you, you said, we need to tell a new story, a better story, a more sure. accurate story. Uh, the, the social business. Can you speak a little bit to the scaling opportunities for social business and what you see, what, what sort of missing in terms of getting social business right now in the post COVID world into, not, let's not, uh, well, into the rural areas, but also into the city. Uh, that's sure. where still yeah. the power is. Sure. Uh, one way I could uh, uh, answer it by saying, uh, while the coronavirus is on, uh, the crisis is on, there's a tremendous amount of activity at all sectors, business sectors and the government and everybody else, uh, to how to prepare ourselves uh, to put back the uh, machine uh, to work again in the full speed, how to get to the full speed of this machine, which is sleeping right now. So, and one, you hear from everybody, how big will be the bailout package for you? So the tons and tons of money is committed to bail you out. You are in trouble, you are in sleeping. So we are pouring money, trillions of crores of rupees and pour in so that we have. 
So the money is not a problem anymore. It's already there. All I'm saying, and instead of pouring in to a fossil fuel industry, which creates all the problems that we have in the world. So this, this time when we do that, we don't pour a, a penny to a fossil fuel industry. And we don't give an opportunity to the fossil fuel industry to wake up again. So that part will slip. Uh, we, and we'll have inspection uh, centers as you cross from the old world to the new world after the coronavirus. Who is carrying the virus of the old world? Fossil fuel is creating the virus of the old world. Plastic industry is creating the virus of the old world. So we'll stop at the gate. Say, sorry, we cannot do that. Uh, this is a new world. You have to throw this out. You can come, but you can't bring your merchandise with you. This, uh, you have to leave it behind. So you start there. So you have said how to scale up. That's a point you wanted to say. Scale up is not a problem because you have the money now, billions of dollars worth of money. A trillion worth of dollars of money. Do with them new businesses, create new financial system, completely new financial system with all the billions of uh, rupees that are trillions of rupees you are going to bail out anyway. So instead of giving it to the people who will be creating the problems, you invest it in the problem, in the companies who will be solving the problem. That's the only choice you have to make. So that choice is always. So finance is not a problem. It's already there. So you'll, be, you'll be spending it in one place or other. So I'm saying that instead of this, you put it here. That's the best opportunity. And prepare ourselves that we have to take this responsibility and make it happen. There is one uh, specific question uh, that, that maybe <laughs> you can Go invite ahead. us also. It's, you, you received the Nobel Peace Prize. What do you think another business person would need to do to get the Nobel Peace Prize in this situation as a business person? What do you think are the biggest challenges that need to be addressed right now that would be deserving of such an honor? Uh, help us get to the new world. Now that the coronavirus put us to sleep, you give us the leadership. If you give the leadership, we'll give you 10 Nobel Prizes, not one. Because you saved the world. Great. Wonderful. That's an aspiration. Um, yes. And, and thank you so much. Nisha, do you want to sort of uh, move us to closing out? Yeah, one uh, very good question is coming out. Uh, that is, uh, without business management course and without the business management uh, uh, systematic institution, how can we teach social business uh, to a common citizen or common person? Uh, yeah, student, yeah, students will be very curious to know. I'm not against business management. That's not what I'm arguing for. I'm saying, what business? That you have to, I don't want to manage somebody to make an enormous amount of money for himself. I'm not a slave to help somebody to make money. That's I want to understand. What is my role? I'm working for him money so that he can make tons of money for himself. I'm an expert in helping him. I don't want to be that expert. I want to ch change the world as a business management person. And my business is to solve people's problems. And I know how to uh, manage a business of uh, solving business uh, problem of the world, uh, society. So there'll be two courses if you want to be generous in your business school. One gives them a conventional MBA so that you are prepared to go out and become the soldier for the fight uh, to make money for big companies so that you become a champion, you become generals, you become uh, top uh, uh, fighters, uh, gladiators to help the company to make more money. Their stock prices goes up and you do that. That's, a that's MBA, the traditional MBA. Then I'll have a social MBA. I'll be trained the same thing, but how to run a social business, how to design a social business, how to solve a problem in a business way, fastest possible way, and get the best result out of it. Make sure you move, you expand, you replicate, and so on. And more and more problems can get solved. How to inspire people to get to, into social business. So I'll teach them on the other side. So there'll be two degrees. One to go and get money for other people, another to solve the problems of the world in doing the business. It's a business school, but the two kinds of business. One to maximize profit, or another, not to make any personal profit at all, but to solve people's problem. That's an exclusive agenda for the business, nothing else. So these are the two things we're talking about. Whether you yes. want to have exclusive uh, business school for social business, that's up to you. But I'm generous, I said, teach both. 
let the student decide which kind of uh, graduate he wants to be or she wants to be, whether she wants to be a social business business graduate or a profit maximized uh, business graduate. That's a choice. So certainly in uh, our resume business school, we'll start social business course. Uh, with Absolutely. Par with, with parallel Absolutely. we are doing conventional. Yeah, it's a choice again. It's yeah, a choice. This is a good time to start because of the Corona crisis. And with your guidance and support. Thank you. Certainly Thank we'll you. Be able to do that. Thank you. Let's do that. That's yes. the beginning. Yeah. So, uh, thank you all for joining this uh, wonderful session. Thank you, sir. Thank you for. Thank you, Nisha. Thank you. Thank you for uh, giving such a wonderful, inspirational, and uh, uh, some really oh, potential thought which you have given, which all of us can uh, take it, even even in the. Thought if you can apply it will be great. And thank Could you. Isha, Isha, just yeah. 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 Hello. Someone wants to speak. So, Nisha, Nisha, I think we're we're closing now. So yeah. okay, okay. We can close so, it so, so. Thanks a lot. And I would say thanks to Zinat and uh, Lamia for uh, and Shabir for uh, creating and uh, arranging everything on time and uh, all the time for uh, arranging this talk on time. Uh, so thank you all for joining this wonderful session. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you much. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.